Welcome everybody to the Global Badass Goddess channel, where we aim to empower and inspire. Today, we're speaking with author, artist, producer, Steve Wagner, who is a member of the San Francisco Film Critics Circle and was also co-host writer and executive producer of Bay Area television programs, Real Life and Film Trip reviewing over a thousand films and interviewing over 300 actors, directors, writers, and musicians. Today, his debut book, All You Need Is Myth, The Beatles and the Gods of Rock, proposes that the Beatles and the iconic stars of classic rock era function as a modern forms of classical archetypes familiar in mythologies and religious traditions throughout history. His book establishes a persuasive argument that these rock gods have not only achieved the status of mythic deities, but were chosen and nurtured for those roles by culture itself because of their inherent resonance with archetypal characters, narratives, and symbolisms. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Glenda. It's great to be here with you and all of the global badass goddesses. Thank you. My this favorite types of people, I believe, in the world. <laughs> this is our pleasure. We're so grateful you're here, and really at a crazy time. I'm just, um, I'm just kind of actually shocked. Um, <laughs> the years of being on this planet and never having any been in any really traumatic yeah. situation. So, well, it's definitely a, uh, it's definitely a challenge for all of us, and yet we've still got to come together. We still have to celebrate our our humanity and we still need to try to create things yeah. that are inspiring and uh it's been an absolute delight being here with you guys it's such a creative environment I, I i love the music and everything you guys are creating here and um i think they call it a perfect symbiotic relationship it's been been yes. my pleasure it's been fabulous i've just really enjoyed your stories and your own history i mean i you're such a music ecologist <laughs> <laughs> you're just it's phenomenal that not only have you been an artist yourself and write you write your own music and that type of thing but you've gone on to take this journey to be an author and taking these 10 years of really dig in to archetypes mythology the beatles like you know and various other artists so i know we're going to get more into sure. that but i'm just i'm so grateful that you've done that um it's it's just been amazing well thank you yeah. it's it's been it's been the most uh illuminating experience of my life i i so many things in my life were pointing me towards this book, playing and singing the music yeah. of the classic rock era, then uh, as a film critic, dissecting archetypal plot and narrative and symbols in films, and then uh, being an art dealer and a gallery director for yeah. a, a major uh, rock photography and original album cover uh, fine art. Uh, so all of these careers were sort of pointing me in the direction of this book. When I started writing it, I thought... I thought it was going to take maybe a year. Yeah. I studied literature and comparative religion in college, and I'm a bit of an encyclopedia when it comes to rock history. Yeah. So I, I thought about a year of hard work, but the fact that it took 10 years, well, it's partially explained by the fact that, uh, you know, I'm not always completely competent, but um, <laughs> it's also explained by the fact that the subject matter went so much deeper than yeah. I expected it. The, the deeper I dug, the more I found. Wow. And it just sort of became this, okay, I guess I'm the person to, to do this. I, I took it as sort of a responsibility that I was tasked with. Okay. It's like this, this is something that I've landed on and okay, it's going to take years to research this. I, I well, just accepted that and decided to do the work because I, I, I thought it was worthwhile. Okay. Well, what was that spark though? Like what, where, what, what was that moment then you went, I've got to write a book about this. Like, right, right. Well, I, I, when I was, uh, representing the, the great, uh, uh, images of rock history in collectible photography and original album cover art, I was, I was just immersed in the imagery of rock history and, uh, I was always asking myself, where does the value really come from? Because my job is 
to sell this art. Yeah. And of course, value is a very important part of the sales process. And of course, part of it is, is that uh, it's nostalgic for pe- for people it hel- you know it helps them remember their their youth mm. part of it is that it's it's a it can be a very smart investment part of it is just that it looks cool the abbey road cover on the living room wall looks cool but it started dawning on me that it was it was a spiritual response mm. that people were having to these artists and that got me thinking and I uh, st- sort of started toying around with a general theory that that what made these artists collectible and and uh, in the art realm, but then as cultural icons, becoming yeah. more important as cultural icons as time goes on, that it had to have some connection to their resonance with classical mythic symbolism mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. archetypes that people were responding to this in sort of an unconscious way. And yet, uh, the more I thought about it, the more it it made sense. And um, speaking with a, a friend of mine that uh, produced a, uh, it was called the Global Sound Conference down in Los Angeles about 10 years ago. And he was fascinated by this theory I was talking about and asked me to speak at this convention which I did, and uh, the reaction was was just so heartening, even though the speech that I gave was a, a very early, you know, uh, very rough version of this hypothesis, hmm. people really responded to it. Interesting. And everybody was asking me, where can I buy the book? And yeah. I thought, well, maybe I need to write a book. <laughs> And, that, and a documentary. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's I, I'm in the all you need is myth business now. You <laughs> That's know, perfect. I just yes. uh, I'm trying to create everything I can. <laughs> so, <clears throat> just understanding archetypes and myths. Yes. Um, how does that support our own deep understanding of ourselves? Well, I think uh, this is one of the keys uh, to the entire thesis of the book, and it's sort of. It's sort of right there on the surface, but uh, but it's 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 good for a reminder that these mythic archetypes, these characters that pop up over and over again in mythic traditions and religious traditions, they're the same sort of stock characters we see over and over and over again in film, like the wise old man. Well, you know, you've got the wise old man Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. You've got Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. You've got Professor Dumbledore in Harry Potter. You've got Merlin with King Arthur. You've got Mm -hmm. Joseph of Arimathea with Jesus. And hmm, you've got George Martin with the Beatles. Mm. Here's this character that pops up over and over again. Oh, interesting. The older, wiser person that guides the hero through the initiation of their journey. This is classic mythic narrative, right? And, that and, we, and we play it out. That's right. We're constantly playing it out without exactly, us knowing it. That's exactly yeah. right. And the reason that these characters resonate in films and novels and, and uh, religions and mythologies is because these mythic archetypes are actually reflections of psychological archetypes hmm. that we all carry around with us all the time. Hmm. This is sort of the core tenet to Jungian psychology, that we contain these are these these archetypes are part of our psyche, the self archetype. That is the central, the perfected version of ourselves. That's an archetype that continually tries to better us and give us the answers that we're seeking. That's the psychological analog of the savior archetype in religions and mythologies and the hero archetypes in literature and film and epic poetry. So all of these all of these archetypes that I talk about in, in the book, the child, the prophet, the Holy Spirit, the devil, the goddess, the magician, all of these archetypes are aspects of all of us yeah. in terms of our essential psychology. So it is very personal. Mm-hmm. It's, it's who we are. It's the, this has to do with our own personal stories 
And these stories that we read and that we see, these, these myths that we're drawn to, uh, are there to reflect ourselves back to us. Okay. Wow. That's very, very interesting. So basically then what you're saying is that we have all of these inside of us. We yes. play them out <clears throat> at right. different times of the day, different times of our life. That's right. <clears throat> and with each other. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, so I know you were talking about um, your female musicians yes. in the book. Yes. Um, can you give us some examples of them and their archetypes mm -hmm. and share that with us? That'd well, I, I find that so interesting. I'm such a fan of female artists and vocalists. And uh, it's, it's interesting when talking about the classic rock era and the artists that have achieved, let's just say, godlike status. Mm -hmm. Goddess, like God, status. Right. There are <laughs> fewer of the goddesses that, that emerge uh, in that milieu. And I think that can be... Uh, I think that can be explained by, by several things. Uh, a fairly patriarchal form of Christianity that existed in the United States in the 1960s. The difficulties of women breaking through mm -hmm. in the creative arts mm -hmm. or in truly any type of industry. Yeah. It's still difficult. It was even harder then. So you have, unlike classical mythology, which contains male gods and female gods mm -hmm. in equal measure and status. The, the rock mythology, at least in the classic rock era, t tips more towards the male gods. Right. And yet, these female archetypes did emerge, and they were every bit as important to the ongoing uh, mythic narrative of yeah. rock and roll. The, the first and the most central character uh, would probably be Joni Mitchell, who is the representation of the classic goddess, the earth mother, mother. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the goddess that is aligned with nature and also the intuitive uh, wisdom, the, the intuitive mm. feminine in, you know, inherent uh, wisdom that's often veiled in mystery. You have this Joni Mitchell represents both of those to such a stark degree. Her early songs being those that literally blur nature mm. with, you know, the inner guiding voice of the individual. Songs like Both Sides Now and Woodstock and Circle Game and Big Yellow Taxi. These songs are all about nature. They're also all about this intuitive feminine voice. And so Joni, uh, th that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch on why Joni embodies this earth mother figure mm. uh, so vividly. And of course, we see it play out in history. She's very likely the most influential female musician of the 20th century. <laughs> I think that case can be made for several people, but in terms of lyrics, songwriting, right. poetry, uh, ef efficiency with all types of musical instruments, yeah. an inherent sense of song structure and poetic structure, yeah. uh, more than 50 alternate guitar tunings that wow. she invented herself. Wow. I did not know if that. If that isn't the mysterious wisdom of the goddess yeah. at work. Well, right? and just to look at her beingness too, right. as she's just so gentle. Right. And, and then we have even. these, we have some other uh, female rock gods that, uh, that embody uh, shamanic archetypes. Grace Slick uh, as the witch archetype <laughs> Janis Joplin as the oracle archetype now the shaman and the medium uh, that's that's a very curious archetype because it because it is concerned with resolving duality and a merger between the say spiritual and physical worlds and utilizes concentrated will and uh, physical ritual hmm. that the shaman brings uh, that archetype is essentially androgynous. And you see 
very interesting that both Grace Slick and Janis Joplin sort of dropped the feminine trappings that popular singers yeah. had uh, had exhibited for decades of recorded music in the 20th century. They rep- they were they weren't up there to be provocative sexually. They were provocative culturally. It was a very mm. different uh, approach to the uh, uh, to the sort of brand, the personal, uh, you know, uh, the character that they that they exhibited to to the public. Now, another goddess that is very uh, important, very influential in terms of rock history is Yoko Ono, who essentially represents the yin to John Lennon's yang. Mm-hmm. That's the lover's archetype, say, in the, in the, in the major arcana of the tarot. Right. <clears throat> the lovers, that is a very, very classic mythic archetype. It's, we, see that, uh, we see that mirrored in... Uh, as opposed to... Yeah, you know, many mythic uh, sexual, spiritual cup, couples like mm-hmm. Shiva and Shakti, right. Jesus and Mary Magdalene, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. There's a lot of mythology that is built around this lover's yeah. archetype. Which, just to add to that, people try to make her out to be the bad guy. Right, of right? course. So what, of course. you know. Yeah. Well, it's, I have to say that uh, doing the research for this book mm-hmm. and... Uh, and really considering it from from this sort of specific detached angle, it's clear to me that if if Yoko didn't exist, the story of the Beatles would not have ended correctly. The hero's journey that that band was on mm. required yeah. that resolution of duality at the end of the story. In the real world, it enabled John to basically tr- find, tr- finally transcend the Beatles and become something even more with yeah. songs like Imagine. Instant Karma and Imagine and yeah. Give Peace a Chance. He, he, he needed that impetus to, to break from the other three Beatles, mm. but by aligning with Yoko and literally uh, dedicating their, their lives and their marriage and their art to this higher cause of peace that elevates the whole savior archetype of the of the hero's journey of the beatles yeah. into that you know higher realm yoko she literally had to be there for the story to contain the correct conclusion isn't that interesting she's very very important to the unfolding story yeah. of the classic rock era yeah yeah and just the mission that they created together. Exactly. How powerful. Yeah. I mean, those songs are. Sure. And it's such an songs. example for the average. I mean, it's a little different here in, in 2020. Uh, you know, our relationships have, have morphed. They're more flexible now. We're yeah. not. Uh, we're used to seeing uh, the, the wives bringing home more, more money than, than the husbands. This is a common thing now. Yeah. But in those days, for the two of them to become life partners, sexual partners, creative partners, you know, parents, yeah. uh, the, the, the way that they uh, the way that they worked together and seemed to be in this cyclical state of mutual inspiration, that was uh, that really modeled a new relationship for the popular culture of the time. And they switched gender roles. She went to work managing their finances. John stayed at home and baked bread and took care of the baby, you know, which was not heard of really back. Then. Right. <laughs> and for someone of John Lennon's stature, mm-hmm. let's just put it that way to understand in the context of that relationship yeah. that they could reinvent themselves that way. I mean, John, John was always very, outgoing about uh his you know his um reliance on yoko he would say i'm the famous one i'm the one that's supposed to know everything but she's my teacher Mm. we should have listened to him 
Wow. You know, all we we just heard her uh, her her singing and thought we don't want that on <laughs> oh. Beatle records. <laughs> and I understand no that screeching, too. screeching, please. And yet, <laughs> she was his teacher. She brought uh, a uh, a very crucial maturity to his life. I believe at a at a very uh, uh, important time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Um, So, okay, so just talking about the overall book and Mm -hmm. the content in the book, what do you believe that your, not mission, but what do you, not, I don't want to say why should people read the book. Mm -hmm. I I just, I guess I want to say more, um, what are we going to get out of Mm -hmm. reading the book? Well, I think, uh, Maybe the most important thing that the book can bring to readers is the reminder, the realization that mythology is alive. We're surrounded by it. The idea that religions stopped occurring after the advent of Christianity or Islam or or uh, Mormonism. That's that's a. That's a mistaken view of the the innate character of mythology, which which is to continually reinvent itself for every new time and culture and language, and never have we seen it so vividly presented as the classic rock era. Those rock stars embodied these mythic characteristics in their life stories in their music, in the symbols that are associated yeah. with their their image and their album covers. So all you need is myth. It's, it's a, structured a bit as a Trojan horse. Mm-hmm. It sort of slips the casual reader past the gates of dogma and into the truly exciting, inspiring world of mythology through these familiar characters, mm. the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, these people that we already uh, resonate with and love, it's, and then there's the, the the mythic subtext that that follows from viewing those characters in through this lens is just really fascinating. I, I think that it will remind people that not only is mythology alive and all around us, but it truly is a reflection of each individual psyche. This is reflecting back to us for a reason. It's because this is who we are Mm, inside, and it helps us uh, touch those, those parts of us that sometimes seem to be hidden, but are still always there. Yeah. Well, it seems like it does, it puts a spotlight on that whole concept. So you could take it to the next level and say, okay, I want to be like Janis Joplin. Right. I want to be the earth mama. Right. You know, I I want to be those things, but I'm afraid to, or I can't. This kind of like, in a way, puts a spotlight on that. Like, you know, you can do this too. Yes, yes. Um, Well, it's very true. And I I think in terms of that, uh, it will help people understand that mimicking mm, these people is mm. not what is required, Mm -hmm. but to find the deeper motivation that yeah. that that drove them to create the art that they created yeah. Janis Joplin in in other words to uh to step into that oracle mm-hmm. archetype that medium it's not about uh, becoming a drug addict right right it's right, not right. about <laughs> <Or dying>. uh, <laughs> letting your <laughs> life go out of control it's not even about uh uh inhabiting some hysterical figure on stage right it's about allowing yourself to open up and receive this divine inspiration and let it come through you in an unobtrusive way and let your own voice the the voice of the oracle that is inside you bring that music and that song to life. She was a channel. Yeah. She got out of the way and let that music just come through this 
otherworldly voice. So, and I think that probably applies to a lot of the archetypes. It's not about copying them. It's yeah. it's it's understanding yeah. the sort of psychological state that they were able to assume yeah. whenever they were creating and performing. Yeah, I can really relate to that a lot. I I had shared this story with you once before about coming off a stage with my bands and, you know, I mean, people come up to me and say, you remind me of Janis Joplin. <laughs> and I would just freak out because I was like, A, I don't look like her, B, I don't do drugs, and C, I'm not dead. So mm-hmm. what is, why, you know, and I never really listened to They're her music. They're perceiving this. Exactly. They're perceiving this. They're exactly. perceiving that you are getting out of the way and letting that big voice of yours do the talking Mm -hmm. and channel this archetypal information. And being able to tap into my inner spirit. Yes. Like what's what's honest for me, what's truthful for me. Because when Janice was singing, I have since watched some things about her. But what I have noticed is that that's part of what she does. She writes, she gets out of the way, she does channel this, and then she just expresses yes. all her emotions yes. for the day. She lets you know? the muse come it's right through her. Phenomenal. And, and she's so raw, and she's so naked, and everybody knew it. You couldn't watch Janice on stage without realizing, yeah. man, I mean, there is, there is some serious power and essential yeah. energy coming through this person yeah. and she's she's in a different psychic realm yeah. than we are she couldn't she could not convey that music the way that she did if she was you know uh concerned about her image or right. any of these things she was just there to just being let, herself let the muse come through her yeah and then and this wonderful feedback loop that she was getting from her audience oh yes like once that happened the audience was like yes oh my god (laughs) and then and then they would go oh my god and send it back to her (laughs) yes i think i think a great example although uh and i certainly will touch on the band queen in the second uh volume of this series but freddie mercury pretty widely considered to be the greatest front man or one of the greatest front men, you know, in the history of 20th century music. He also had that relationship with his audience. Everybody knew just how bad Freddie needed to be up there on stage. And Freddie knew just how much everybody needed somebody like him to be up there prancing and giving it away. Yes. And that's our relationship to royalty. Right. We need royalty. We need people in capes and crowns. And we we, we totally. need that pomp and circumstance. And Freddie was so happy to bring that to the people. Uh, I, I just see that that symbiotic relationship between performer and audience is so joyful when you watch him on stage you get that with Mick Jagger too although there's a bit of a darker side a bit of a darker <laughs> edge to that with Janice it's completely raw it's completely yeah. naked it's like but it's that same it's that same relationship between performer and audience and a lot of that is actually biological it has to do with the concept of entrainment, mm. music and vibration, rhythms entrain us to the performer. They entrain us to each other in the audience. Yes. It's a connective thing. We literally entrain physically yeah. to each other whenever we're exposed and, and in, the, in, the same, uh, in the same musical or realm yeah. of sound. So it's it's uh, it's yeah. very powerful. Yeah, it really is. I think you're you're uh, you're saying a lot around you know words, vibration, yeah. tone, harmony, yes. all of it. It it either turns us on or turns us yes. off. Yes, you know, and um, and I think what you're pointing to in the book is is phenomenal because these people were gifted and excellent. They they showed up just as who they are. Yes, a hundred percent. Yes. I mean, there isn't a time, and I remember in this time period, where you would ever mix Mick Jagger with Queen. Right. You you know, you heard the first note, you go, Queen. Yes, of course. Right? right. You'd, or you'd hear like, dah, 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 you know, go, Mick Jagger. Right. Like right away. Right. But now it's all homogenized sounding, which is, right. is 
I know there's a purpose for it, but I just don't understand it. Well, sometimes. you're right. I mean, the, especially <laughs> back then, the, the the music, especially from these top tier artists, mm-hmm. was so singular and unique. Right? It is. It's hard to believe that a lot of this seminal music was created at the same time. The Who are doing this kind of music and Bob Dylan is doing this kind. Joni Mitchell is doing this kind and the beach boys are doing this kind. And yet they're all distinct. It's, it's, it's all, it's all very, very, uh, very distinct. Yeah. And they, each one of them held a a message and a vibration for each, not only who they were being, but the music that they were writing. And I think it's very telling, uh, that when looking at the way that some of their careers played out, uh, you can see the importance of the uh, the collective, the buying public. We're literally putting our money where our mythology is. We're <laughs> we're we're investing in these characters that are reflecting something valuable back to us, and that's never uh, more so obvious than when these artists tried to veer away from their archetypes. For example, oh. Brian Wilson, a classic child archetype, Forrest Gump, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Pippi Longstocking, The Little Prince, these classic child archetypes. And that was Brian in The Beach Boys. The songs, they're called The Beach Boys. They're not called The Beach Men. <laughs> you know, he's writing songs that are concerns for kids, motorbikes, hot rods, surfboards, the beach, all these sorts of things. Well, you know, in the mid-60s, 66, 67, Brian is, he's maturing as a composer. He's no longer wanting to do these car and surf centric songs he's basically becoming george gershwin he's writing what essentially are amounting to classical symphonies yeah well the fans his record label his family and his band everybody's like nope no you can't do that you've (laughs) got to be this guy we want we need you to be the child archetype yes so his audience bristled at that interesting joni mitchell She's for, you know, uh, nearly 10 years is embodying this earth mother uh, archetype with songs about nature and the intuitive wisdom. When she took that left turn into jazz about 1976, her audience went, "Mm, no, we, we need the Stevie Nicks. Her, her, that Joni's audience, that early audience of hers just shifted their attention Stevie and Nicks. their adoration onto this new goddess maiden, mm. Stevie Nicks. And then Stevie Nicks became the, the primary goddess in the rock mythology yeah. for a few years until it was time to roll over again. And Madonna mm. then comes in onto the scene and reinvents the sex fertility goddess Got for it. the age of MTV and corporatism and cocaine, right? So <laughs> we see how the audience shifts its love, its, its focus yeah. away from these artists when they veer off that archetypal path, mm. we need and want these people to stay there and give us that character. But of course, great artists like Brian Wilson and Joni Mitchell, they're maturing. They're real people. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. they're not just mythic they're archetype <laughs> archetypes. Yeah. They're actually evolving. Yeah. And as artists, of course, Brian is going to want to you course. know, compose symp- symphonies. Of course, Joni is going to want to take this yeah. deep musical and lyrical acumen into deeper waters that that jazz music enabled her to do. Yeah. So it's just very interesting. Yeah. You can see that relationship between art, uh, between audience and artist. This plays out over yeah. and over again, and I think that I think that somewhat proves the 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 essential thesis yeah. of this book you can you can see it happen yeah well and you can also <clears throat> just kind of going back to what you said about that is that <laughs> you can really see that audiences want what they want you know and you sold them 
on Earth Mama. Exactly. So we're going to either That's move right. on sure. or you're going to get back in Earth Mama. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting how that is, yes, right? Yes, it is. And we, you're, and we you're right. We call it branding now, yeah. but yeah. but this is... This is deeper. This is mythic branding. Yeah. It's arc it's an archetypal yeah. reality. It's an archetypal understanding that that we all instinctively yeah. understand. Yeah. But we're not sort of consciously yeah. aware of it. Well, the book is absolutely luscious. Um it's deep and yet it's fun and it's inspiring. You're like, oh my God, I didn't know about that. <laughs> um so yeah, you'll have to people have to read this. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um I got a few more questions and then we can kind of let you go. Okay. But um I guess my my last question was um so the Beatles and rock and roll how did that inspire your life Well uh I was the perfect age I was 4 years old when when the Beatles actually no I was 3 years old I'm sorry I was 3 years old when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan I remember seeing it on the TV I was sitting in a high chair <laughs> eating dinner with my parents in the living room. And I remember seeing the Beatles on tell and just immediately I just thought, I, I just love them. The music, the vibration of those early songs, uh, just, it made me so happy and you can see it still to this day. You put a five-year-old down and play them Beatles. They're not, they're not musically mature minds. They're just responding to this positive vibration. And uh, with each new song, and of course, that was another thing back in those times. Yeah, things were moving quickly. There was a new Beatles single every three or four months. And the, so, and the sound, it just got better and better. You just couldn't believe that they kept writing these perfect songs. Yeah. That's what they sounded like to me uh, when I was seven years old. My cousin uh, was drafted and on his way to Vietnam, and he very graciously gave me his records. I didn't realize, you know, <laughs> at the age of seven, I, I, I wasn't uh, grieving over the fact that my cousin was going into combat. I was just <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thrilled that that record collection was going to, you know, come home with me. Yeah. And uh, he had all the Beatle albums up through maybe Rubber Soul, a couple of Stones, a couple of Beach Boys, Mamas and the Papas. You know, the Dave Clark Five, you know, just some of the great records from that era. Back in the day when you had to purchase them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this wasn't rel easily procured. Well, I just, I just, I just played the grooves off of those albums. And, you know, of course, the Monkees came along and I was just the right age for that, yes. too. And, uh, you know, the Beatles were always, uh, they were just, I found them so inspiring and so interesting. I read every book that I could get my hands on, and for decades there weren't many books written on them. Information was much yeah. harder to come oh, by. Yeah. And uh, so you bonded with friends. Okay, I've got Rubber Soul. He's got Revolver. Yeah. Let's swap, swap. them for the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks. And <laughs> that's how you discovered music in those days. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just amazing to me now. Here we are now, 50 years after their final recording, wow. it's almost like looking at history through the opposite end of a telescope, trying to find this detached position. I already know what it's like when I'm completely immersed in it, then trying to detach and view this from outside for, with the, you know, the benefit of hindsight, in fact, decades of hindsight, and try to answer the question, why? Why them? Mm. What was it about them that made everybody instinctively go that? Yeah. And I think all you need is myth at least gives some juice towards answering that question. It's because they embodied the classic hero, savior archetype and the narrative that we watched them play out through the decade of the 60s uh, was literally the greatest story ever told 
unfolding before our eyes and in our ears, in our ears, in our eyes, in our media, yeah. in all of our lives. Yeah. And um, it clearly still resonates with people all over the world. It It's showing no signs of slowing. Yeah. 50 years later, yeah. they're still one of the still hottest inspiring. properties in show business. Yeah. And they're still inspiring people to pick up that guitar, try to write that song, yeah. be in a band. Yeah. 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 Well, for our last question, I just want to know, give us one of your favorite quotes. Favorite quotes. There are so many. Um, because we've just finished recording the audio book, and I just literally said this quote into a microphone yesterday. It's <laughs> fresh in my mind. It would be uh, a quote from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And he says, um, actions do not affect me, and a reward for actions does not attract me. Only love can behold me thus. And that's what this book is about. It's mostly about the Beatles. The Beatles are a symbol for love. That all-inclusive potential emotion that we can bring to everything in our lives. Love enables us to overcome everything, no matter how difficult it is. It sounds like a cliche, but in a sense, all we need is love. And I think that's what, that's what Krishna is talking about. That's what Buddha is talking about. That's what Jesus is talking yeah. about. And that's what the Beatles are talking about too. We shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be picky from where we get this that's important right. truth. That's right. We should be open to it from wherever it comes, from whatever mythology, from whatever angle, and then pass it along. Yeah. That's, that's what we're here for. To love and be loved. Exactly. All right. It's not a cliche. No. It's real. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your essence and your talent. And uh, we're definitely grateful for you, Steve. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so well, much, thank Glenda. you for joining us. But here we got Steve's book. You can get that. We'll give you the. Uh, it's to, easy. Way to buy Amazon. It. All oh, Amazon. You can get it on all Amazon. All you need is myth.com. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenda. <laughs>